Oh, bless you. What a gorgeous song. What a wonderful message. I, I, I'm loving America. <laughs> I'm loving. It's coming to an ugly turning point. Ah, I don't ever want to get there. Uh, this series did not start with where we've been. It started with Bill and Dale's book called Dark Agenda. A book that describes the effort of the enemy of Christ to destroy the lamp of America in the world. And so it is filled largely with things that we're going to see as very negative. I'm still a couple of weeks from getting there. I determined that there was no way I wanted to dr jump into what's happened that's gone wrong in our country without first spending some time with the fabulous, wonderful, glorious things that have been happening, you know, that have happened and that are miraculously inclined. Uh, I've been reading three books primarily for this group of, uh, there's about seven or eight of them all together, but some of them are just reference books. Uh, the Miracle of America is a great book, uh, followed by a second book called American Miracle. I mean, it's just kind of the same thing. Uh, and then a third book, Seven Miracles That Saved America. Um, those are all three really great books, and they have been the basis of most of what we have done so far in, in reading through those and identifying those things. Um, uh, if you have, <laughs> and, and uh, a, a bunch of you, uh, those of you connected to school, you might look and see if you have a history book by an author by the name of Howard Zinn. He is about as liberal as would be available. You hope you don't have his history book. Uh, you hope that's not the book you have because he sees America as nothing but the product of greed. That's his, I mean, in one word, how has America got where it got? Greed. That's how we got there. Um, it's it's not just innocence. It's not just innocence. It's intentional. Um, it's an attempt to take America in a different direction. Now, we are talking about the term we use, American exceptionalism. Indicating in that word that we have... Not that we're better than anybody else. That's not the point. The point is that we have been given exceptional opportunity to be a blessing to the world because God has blessed us. God has intervened in events that would naturally have gone a different direction based on the score at the moment. The outcome would have been different, but God intervened. Last week we talked about the, uh, uh, the escape that George Washington made across the river. Uh, it, just this week I got the new book, uh, The uh, Seven Miracles That Saved America. They identify that same one. They, they have a different title for that chapter. They call it The Miraculous summer fog, the miraculous summer fog. Um, but God changed things. We're looking at history. I don't know who brought it, I don't know who grabbed a hold of it, but I've heard it my whole life. History is really his story, God's story. History is really his story, the story of God and how he has worked. And knowing as we look at God's overall plan, not going there, I'm going to Ephesians chapter uh, 6 in a minute, but looking at 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish. 
but that all, all means Ethiopia, <laughs> it, means, it means South America, it means China, it, it, it means Norway, it means all. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God isn't just looking to save a few Americans. That is in no way the point of where we are going or where we have been. Our point is that God intends to bless the world and he will use an available vehicle to do that. And if we are willing to be that vehicle, then we get the privilege of riding in that car of blessing as God ministers to the rest of the world. God chose Abraham. God chose Abraham because Abraham was a righteous man. And God said, I will bless your descendants. And they became the Jewish people. They became the Jewish people. But they rejected, they rejected their Messiah. And in Matthew 28, God sends, Jesus sends his disciples onto all the world. He sends them onto all the world. And so we see that it's not a localized thing. God wants to bless the world, not any group of people. He was using the Jews, and they will come back. The Jewish people will come back to God. If you read the last pages in the book. But for now, they are not the vehicle that God would have them to be. And we need to be willing to be in that position. Looking then at Ephesians chapter 6. The battle we fight is a much bigger battle than we can ever identify. None of us are able to identify the size of this enormous battle that we are in. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, you know where we're going. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. <laughs> These aren't just flesh and blood enemies, which is why Greg's sword is sufficient. Uh, it's not a sword made of steel. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but we are fighting against the evil rulers and authorities, not necessarily in Russia and China and somewhere else, but of the unseen world. What? You mean there are rulers and authorities in the unseen world? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a clue of the other world. We don't have the faintest idea of the battle that rages out there that, that he's talking about here. We are fighting against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's the battle we are looking at. So we see chapters of this battle played out on earth. But it's a bigger battle than we can ever identify. We think we saw the battle, and we know what we did see. But we don't begin to know the overall battle that Satan has put up in order to attain a presence in the world and the way that God intends to defeat him in the end. These are all things that are beyond our understanding. The battle is bigger than anything we might imagine. So as we take a look then at America, remembering that in 1620 when the Mayflower was about to land, the group all got together and they signed the Mayflower Compact. And in that, they stated that their purpose was for the glory of God and for the advancement of his kingdom. That was their stated purpose. And in so doing, they demonstrated they wanted to serve the living God. And God blessed them. And we have been the recipients of the great blessings that flowed through them to us. In 1776, we were looking to get away from 
the motherland. The motherland was becoming oppressive, and if God was going to do other things, it fell within his will to provide a blessing, a pathway for us to become our own nation. We first began to stake that territory out in 1776, even though we'd been somewhat at war for a year. In 1776, we signed the Declaration of Independence, and the most important line in that document was, we believe all men are created equal. Now, there's enormous conflict. How could we say that when we were trading slaves at the very moment that we wrote it? Okay, We're going to deal with a little of that this morning. Uh, we perceive all men to be created equally. That was a very unique concept in the world of 1776. That was not a common concept around the world. The war did not really end until the Treaty of Paris in 1783. The battle was somewhat over, but the treaty was not signed until 1783, and we call it the Treaty of Paris. And that ended the Revolutionary War. Then we had to determine, are we going to stay with the Articles of Confederation or do we need a better document to move us on down the road? I could have taken another week or a month or three months on just the Constitution. I chose not to spend a week on the Constitution because you have to know the Constitution was an unbelievable collection of miracles of getting the right people in the right place at the right time. Absolutely beyond human ability to collect the groups of people that came together and made our Constitution. And so they formulated our Constitution. And they were ready to, in fact, send it to the people in 1787. They met for several months. And it's the complete thing is a series of miracles that are put together it would not be ratified until June 21st of 1788. But the, but the Constitutional Convention ran headlong into one battle bigger than they could fight. The biggest issue that could not be accomplished in the Constitutional Convention was the issue of slavery. If they really insisted on throwing slavery out at the point of the original Constitutional Convention, they would have disbanded and fallen apart. And so they came to a compromise. They came to a compromise for all those people that, that think they were, they were nothing, uh, that they were greedy and that they were looking for a way to feather their own beds and therefore they didn't care about the slave not true at all. They agreed to a moratorium. They agreed that the slave issue was significant, but they said it cannot be dealt with for 20 years in our congressional method. And so from 1788 until 1808, they did not discuss slavery. The issue was off the board, it's been put away. We will deal with it later. We know it needs to be dealt with, but we'll deal with it later. So, immediately in 1808, bam, they dealt with it. They dealt with it in, the, in 1808 by simply saying, from this day forward, no ship shall bring additional slaves into this country. You've got who you've got. We'll deal with that at another point. But we stopped the slave trade business at that point. Now, in doing that, that created an enormous economic change in the South. The South began making a really big economic change when we passed that law in 1808. By not being able to import 
slaves, the value of the slave you had increased dramatically. Now, all of us northerners, we can sit here and throw rotten oranges and tomatoes at the people in the south and say, if we'd have had slaves, we'd have gladly given them freedom. Yeah, you bunch of hypocrites. By 1860, a male slave in his prime was worth $3,000. 1860, a male slave was worth $3,000. You could also buy, you could take your $3,000 and buy land if you wanted to. How much land could you buy? How much cotton land could you buy for $3,000? 500 acres. That helps you get an idea of how valuable a slave was. The truth of it is, southern wealth was 60% invested in slavery. So when we said you got to turn them all loose tomorrow, we said we want you to devalue your worth by 60%. We want you to cut your worth by 60%. All of you that thought you had a million-dollar estate, you really only have 400,000. Turn them all loose. It became a very economic thing, and you have to give those people a little room and a little understanding. What they were doing was still marketing people, but you do have to at least give them room to understand that this was a severe economic impact on them. So between the years of 1808 and 1860, our country just kept getting further and further apart because slavery was a growing, growing, growing cancer on our society. And with that, the division was ever growing. In 1809... (laughs) Abraham Lincoln was born. Uh, All of the books that I'm reading point out throughout his life, frequently there would be a comment made, that's the saddest man I've ever seen in my life. One, One man was to paint a portrait of him, said, I have never painted a portrait of a sadder face than Abraham Lincoln. Uh, He was three years old when his little brother died. Uh, He had a baby brother, only lived several days, and then died. That impacted Abraham Lincoln. He was nine years old when his mother died. Uh, That impacted Abraham Lincoln greatly. Uh, At ten and a half, he, he, he received a wonderful stepmother. Praise God for wonderful stepmothers. Uh, That's not the story of a lot of stepmothers. A lot of stepmothers don't get great bouquets of flowers. But Abraham Lincoln loved his stepmother. She was the one who endorsed his academic desire. Uh, His dad considered him lazy and worthless. Lazy kid wants to do nothing but lay around and read. His dad would whip him when he caught him reading because he should be out pounding Uh, nails or digging fence posts. His dad resented the kid's ability to write notes about dad that dad couldn't read. Yeah. Um, History does not record Abraham Lincoln ever saying one positive word about his father. When his father was on his deathbed, A stepbrother said, Abe, you might want to come home. And Abraham Lincoln said, I fear that my coming would create more pain than it would good. He didn't go home. He didn't go back for the funeral. Uh, His father invoked a law that most neighbors did not invoke. Kids, there was a wonderful law in the 1800s. The law was real simple. Until you were 21, every dime you made went to dad. Pretty good law, huh? Not a bad law. Not a bad law, man. Uh, Well, by Abraham Lincoln's time, the neighbors had pretty much abandoned it, but not Abraham Lincoln's dad. 
Abraham Lincoln's dad demanded every dime that Abraham ever made so that later in his life, Abraham Lincoln would say, I myself was a slave once. I know what it's like to work without ever receiving benefit from what you've given. At age 26, his beloved girlfriend, Ann Rutledge, died. Uh, man, that hit him so hard, they actually put him under watch for suicide. They believed he might kill himself. Abraham Lincoln himself wrote a poem about suicide uh, that was published in the newspaper uh, under, under uh, an anonymous name, but eventually was, in fact, proven to be Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln would not carry a pocket knife because he was afraid of what he would do with it. So he really did go through great fits and bouts of depression when he was young. We hear of all of Abraham Lincoln's failures, but sometimes we don't pick up on the fact he was a state representative in his own state for eight years. He was a federal representative for two years, might have gone even further, but he had pledged when he took it that he was only going to go for two years, and so he did. He was only a federal representative for two years. It might be worth noting that in Springfield, Illinois, he was considered the best lawyer in town for 20 years. He had a great law practice, and he was an enormously popular lawyer. He was a great orator. He had an ability to use the emotion of his life to direct his speaking. And so he had an enormous ability on the platform. He was not a churchgoer. Oh, don't we wish we could say he was a churchgoer? Yeah, we'd love to, but it'd be a lie. He wasn't. His dad was a faithful Baptist. I made that up. I don't know what he was, but he was a faithful churchgoer. It probably told me, but I didn't pay enough attention when I was reading it to write it down. I, I don't know what, but he was a faithful churchgoer. The problem was, like so many kids, they're able to see that dad's a hypocrite. So Abraham Lincoln really didn't want anything to do with the things that his father was driven by. And so throughout his life, he was never a churchgoer. We'll come back to that. But he simply wasn't. He believed in God, but he wasn't a churchgoer. Okay? Um, but he always believed from little up he would tell people that he believed God had a plan for his life that somewhere he would fit into God's almighty plan. He did believe that all men were equal. He believed that with all of his heart. He really believed that slavery was a wrong, an evil. So in 1857, in 1857, the Supreme Court made the Dred Scott decision. What was the Dred Scott decision? Dred Scott was a black man who had been in a free state. His master died, but somebody else grabbed him and took him back to a slave state, and he went to court to gain his freedom. It ended up in 1857 in the U.S. Supreme Court. The problem with the Supreme Court in 1857 was that the majority were Southerners. There were five Southern justices. Obviously, it was going to go against him. So the Dred Scott decision of 1857 simply declared that a black man was, had no more right than a cow or a sheep. He was chattel property. He was property. In some states, you could even murder one of your slaves. You could kill him, decide he was worthless. You could kill him with no penalty at all. In other states, it was a very minimal penalty. That law irated Abraham Lincoln and probably was the impetus for him deciding to run for president. The, the pathway that he took to presidency is a 20-minute story of a miracle all in itself. There were 11 Republican candidates for the presidency. 
He was number 11th and a long way behind number 10. And yet on the third ballot, he became the candidate. And it's a miraculous story of how it unfolds. It would take another whole day. But nonetheless, at the end of that convention, he came out as the presidential candidate. Probably he became president because of one speech that he made in New York City. He went to New York, 1,200 miles train ride, went to New York, 1,500 people paid 25 cents apiece, and they listened to him speak, a fairly long speech that he had very carefully prepared. I actually decided, I cut a, I cut a page out of the book. I am ruthless to books. I got here early enough, I photographed it. But if I had to, I would have cut the page out. I am ruthless, but I said, there is no way, there's no way to do this better than to. And so it comes from the perspective of a lady who was there that night. Initially, observers noted that the new suit that he had bought for the occasion fit him poorly. When Lincoln rose to speak, I was greatly disappointed, remembered one member of the audience. He was tall, tall, oh how tall, and so angular and awkward that I had for an instant a feeling of pity for such an ungainly man. Odd fellow, I thought to myself, you won't do. It is all very well for the Wild West, but this will never go in New York. But as Lincoln launched into his address, the impression changed immediately, almost miraculously. The whole man was transfigured. I forgot his clothes, his personal appearance, and his individual peculiarities. Presently forgetting myself, I found myself standing on my feet like the rest, cheering this wonderful man. (laughs) Probably that speech got him elected uh, in a day when, uh, when they didn't have television and reporters to capture everything. That speech was printed and, 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 and broadcast over and over and over in every paper in the nation, and it became the speech upon which his, in fact, presidency was declared. On the day he became president, the secession movement took off. Within days, states were seceding from the nation, and by the time he finally took control on March 4th, 1861, our country was a divided country going into war. Now, he was elected by the people, but you might find this interested. He was absolutely hated by the politicians in all parties. Yeah. He had one friend in his cabinet, William Seward. William Seward was the only member of his own cabinet that gave him any support or believed in him. He had enemies surrounding him completely. Forty days after his inauguration, the Confederates attacked Fort Sumter and the war was officially on its way. In July of 1861, and remember, he he took office in March of 1861. But in July of 1861, the South won the first battle of Bull Run. It was a major battle. July 1861, they won the first battle of Bull Run. Now, in August of 62, a few months later, uh, 13 months later, The the South won the second battle of Bull Run. Now, there were other conflicts in that 13 months, and the North won some and the South won some, but from a world viewpoint, the two biggest battles of the war were the the battles of Bull Run, one and two. And the fact that Lincoln had lost them both did not go well on a world stage for him. The world was watching. And so it became very, very critical 
In fact, the North had blockaded the southern shipping points so that cotton could not leave America. That did not please Europe. England and France both wanted the cotton. They didn't care who won. They wanted the cotton. So they determined, after the Second Battle of Bull Run, France and Britain agreed that if, in fact, the Confederate won one more major battle, that France and Britain would join with the Confederacy and declare them the winner, and they would force the northern states to concede the war. So as we come to the Battle of Antietam, we are, in fact, really, really in a dangerous kind of a way because things are, are if we don't win this one, we are in trouble. So after the Second Battle of Bull Run, Lee begins to march toward Antietam. The South's victory at Antietam would absolutely guarantee forward motion. Lincoln prayed. When Lincoln came to office, he invested himself in two things. Remember, he had, he, he, he had no church background. But the second he arrived in Washington, he became a member of the Presbyterian Church. That church is still there. That church still has the Lincoln pew. Um, I preached for Red Tolman. Uh, I, I, I did a funeral for Red Tolman in Massachusetts years ago. And in the church we did it. It told you on the end of the pew whose pew that was. Lincoln paid $50 to rent that pew for the first year of the presidency, and he paid $50 every year thereafter. That pew is still there, the Lincoln pew in the Presbyterian Church. When Lincoln arrived in Washington, he invested himself in two things, Bible study and the study of war. He just devoured Bible study because from day one, he believed it was God's war. And while he had not spent his life following Scripture, he would now pour every minute that he could into knowing the Bible better. The other thing he did was study war. Jefferson Davis had a great knowledge of war. Lee was a great warrior. The North was really without the warriors. Lincoln determined he would be, he would be the director of the war because his cabinet was completely against him. And so he invested himself in studying war and studying Scripture. Now, here we are. We're at the edge of Antietam. It doesn't look good for the North at all. Antietam looks like another victory for General Lee. Lincoln goes into prayer, and he says, God, I need a sign that I am on the right course. I need to know, God that you, in fact, are directing the North to win this war. He did that on the 13th of September, 1862. And on that very day, in a field outside of Antietam, Lee and his soldiers had already marched through this area heading into Antietam. General McClellan was coming behind him to catch up to him to be involved in the battle. And they came to a point where Lee had camped the day before. They stopped there, and were going to spend the night. Everybody uh, built fires and laid back and relaxed. Nothing like a lazy preacher. So, these two guys were actually just laying back, relaxing, when one of them sees an envelope. And he reaches over and he picks up this envelope. He opens it. There are three cigars in an envelope wrapped in two pages of paper. He's more, much more concerned about the three cigars than he is the two pieces of paper. So they're fascinating themselves with their newfound wealth of their cigars. 
when on a second thought they think they ought to look at the papers. And it's General Lee's instructions for the Battle of Antietam. It's his secret instruction plan for how we will win Antietam. He sent it to four different generals, and one of them has been lost in the grass. History never found out who lost it. I'm sure nobody ever admitted they didn't have their copy. I want to read that to line right out of the history book as well because it was so uh, it was it, it was it was it, it was such a, a unique thing that uh, that he got it. Lincoln was the beneficiary of the greatest security leak in American history and the only leak that finally affected the outcome of a great war. Uh, here he was, praying that God would give him a sign, and on that very day, they found that paper. And the North won the Battle of Antietam, and by winning the Battle of Antietam, England and, and France quickly backed away and said, hey, we're staying out of it, we're staying out of it. It changed the world. The Battle of Antietam was the high point for the South. War was a long ways from over. But they really never regained the momentum they had at the Battle of Antietam. So Lincoln marked that as a very, very significant point in the war. A second point would come in July of 1863, when, in fact, they were going into the Battle of Gettysburg. Lee is back. Lee wanted to run an offensive war. He didn't want a war in the south. He wanted the war up north. He wanted to keep the north on the offensive. And so he's marching into Gettysburg. Antietam was the bloodiest day of battle America has ever fought. 6,000 soldiers were killed in one day at Antietam. Now, the Battle of Gettysburg will be the overall bloodiest battle. Uh, 8,000 men will be dead when it's done, and 42,000 more will be wounded and unable to fight. Pretty serious. But as Gettysburg comes together, Lincoln's supporting generals and his cabinet all believe that Lee is going to win Gettysburg. And they therefore believe that they need to evacuate Washington because it's only an 84-mile distance from Gettysburg to Washington, D.C. They want Lincoln to go into hiding. They believe that Lee is going to take it. And so the battle starts on July 1st, and Lee really mops the ground. July 2nd, Lee wins again all day long. By late in the afternoon of July 2nd, people are concerned that Abraham Lincoln is remaining completely relaxed. He's not pacing the floor. He is a man of peace. And so he's interviewed. He's asked to explain his attitude of, of total quietness. And Lincoln said, I fervently prayed that God would give me a sign that he would give this victory to the North. And after I prayed, a few minutes later, a peace overwhelmed me that convinces me we're okay. And the third day, the Battle of Gettysburg turned to the North, and the North would win the Battle of Gettysburg. From there on, the war was really over. Um, it, it, it took another year and a half before the surrender. But the South would never again rise up to be able to make an offensive move against the North. The tide had been turned. The tide had been turned. Lincoln believed that God allowed, this was a hard page, Lincoln was asked, why, if God was in this, why did God make us go through five years of war? 
And Lincoln's answer to that, and you can come up with your own answer, but Lincoln's answer to that was, Lincoln believed God allowed such a long war that we might feel the penalty of abusing humans as we had. That we might recognize the penalty for which we had done sufficiently that we would never do that kind of thing again. Historians have sat down with their computers and tried to, what if the South had won? What would the world be like if the South had won? <laughs> and every scenario they run puts the world in a state of totalitarianism today had America fallen apart at that point. American exceptionalism isn't an idea, it's a fact. God stopped Hitler by raising Lincoln. Stand with me. Father, oh Lord, we are so privileged to be passengers on this boat called America. Father, the heavy work was done long before we ever got on the boat. But, Father, that boat requires additional maintenance. And the guys who built it, who dedicated it to you, have long since got off the ship and they have entrusted the care of that ship to our generation father we find ourselves in a generation that says we're not even sure this ship is worth keeping we're not sure this boat is worth preserving and we b believe that it was built upon greed not upon the will of God. Father, we find ourselves at a giant turning point in our culture. We pray, Lord, that this generation would look to our past and would look to the God of our past and would call out to you, Father, as all of the singers in the last weeks have indicated, would call out to you, Father, forgive us, cleanse us, and use us that this ship might remain a ship of freedom for generations yet unborn. Father, we thank you for America. In your name we pray. Amen.